So um, we, I am so happy Paul, that you have uh, invited us to be here with you today. Um, I'm going to start with the introduction of our royal, imperial, high, magnificent guests um, today. Um, I will start with uh, Professor Bello, and I just want to say that there aren't enough words and time um, to introduce you so i will also be very brief um and you know the guests can uh, research more later um so professor baina Bello first earned an administrative degree in new york state university she then went on to gain a bs of education and ms in linguistics her professional teaching career began in 1969 in the usa while teaching Arabic at the Muhammad University of Islam. That's where she discovered the joy for writing and published several language manuals and children's storybooks. Whoever has children in the audience, I really highly recommend you to buy and read the books of Professor Bello, especially all of them, but especially her last book, um, she, or well, the last one I know, maybe there would be more. Shiro's of the Haitian Revolution is really inspiring. And, you know, some people say, what earth are we going to leave to our children? And I ask myself as a mother, what children are we going to leave to this earth? So let us make them read the books of Professor Bello so that they are better humans. Um, Professor Bello lived in Liberia, in Nigeria, in Togo. She visited all of West African countries and several others in the continent. As a lover of art and artifacts, she established and ran an art gallery in Lomé. And I also want to say that, um, well, we are here in the frame of a work we did with my partner, uh, Leandro Nerefu, that is an homage to the riches of IT. And one, uh, I mean, our, you know, star dancer is from Lomé and she runs a gallery in, Lo she, uh, sorry, she runs a dance studio in Lomé called Grand Chocolat and she's the one who taught me the Yann Valou dance because she, her tata, her godmother, uh, who is Beatrice Maniga, uh, was very, very important and is very important for the dance scene in Togo. So when I read uh, Professor Beloyer bio, I was like, Togo in the house. Um, so, um, well, Professor Velo returned to uh, Haiti in 1979 and taught Hausa and language and culture in the State University of IT. As one of Haiti's preeminent anthropologists from the State University of Haiti, Professor Velo is among the professional educators to have dedicated her life's work to the struggle of human rights and dignity for Haitian people. And there's more, but she is the founder of uh, Fondation Felicité, and, uh, she, and she runs Fondation Felicité. And also, I recommend you all to watch her um, program online, which is Baina and Friends, uh, that is really very important and magnificent. Mm, Professor Bello, could you unmute your mic and give us a hi and say whatever words you might want to say right now? Greetings to everyone. Greetings to all those we don't see, those who created the light and made the path for us. Uh, greetings to all of you present in this room to follow this program. And certainly, most elaborate greetings to all who will be, who are on the panel, and Ngan Jean Daniel. It's my pleasure to share this panel with you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Bello. Um, Paul, could I ask you to mute um, your microphone just for sound? So, Monsieur Jean Daniel Lafontaine uh, is a Vodou V, he's a healer, a Hougan, and an aficionado of Haitian art and culture. He was born with the gift of clairvoyance and he was first initiated by members of his paternal grandfather based in the city of Leogan. 
Later, he was introduced to the tradition of his maternal ancestors as an own sea of La Cou Jisu. I am, um, please, Jean Daniel, correct my um, pronunciation later if you, <laughs> I'm saying things wrong. Um, he became a Sevite and Hogan in 1997. And uh, a year later, in December, he co founded the sacred temple Narive 777 which I am proud to say is my home in port au uh, In 1988, he created a New York-based group, ANAE, an association whose primary goal was the promotion of Haitian art influenced by Vodou. And since 2003, he has worked as a consultant to various media as well as art and academic institutions and projects, the list is infinite. Uh, he is a mentor together with Egbo Mi Nasiji Sousa to the project that um, we conjured with uh, Leandro and many more. So we are so thankful for your guidance, Hugan um, Jean Daniela Fontan, and for being here with us. Could you unmute your phone and Say whatever you need to say right now. Oh, your um, microphone is muted. Thank you for that wonderful introduction, um, Cecilia. It's an honor to be here. And Professor, Professor Bello, it's always a privilege uh, to see you, to learn from you. So sharing that platform with you is either a greater privilege so thank you for uh, the honor of um, allowing me to be on that platform with you and to all that are listening um, i'm saying bon soleil uh, as the sun is quite often considered of mother and of father particularly in the um, in uh, in the voodoo right so i'm saying bon soleil uh, to all of you that are watching us today Hey, Bobo. Oh, let the sun give me peace to speak slow. <laughs> I'm now like, we need to get fast. Um, I don't want to be taking time. Um, so we're here in the frame. First of all, I want to show you all a map so that we situate ourselves. I'm going to share a screen very fast. Um, so you'll see what we're going to be talking about. So this is um, a map, a very colonial map. I'm sorry, it's not the proper um, measurements or, and, and, you know. But so y'all are in um, Antwerp <laughs> in Belgium. Uh, I am in Bahia in the Northeast of Brazil. Uh, well, Professor Velo, Hugan Jean Daniela Fontan and myself are all in the continent of Abia Yala that is uh, probably known by all of you by the Americas. And I am born in Walmapu territory in the south of Abiyayala. And we, today we are going to be centering IT. We're gonna move from our world of violent Eurocentrism for a brief time to fill ourselves with energy and knowledge, ancestral millennial knowledge from IT. I'm going to zoom in for those of you that don't know where the island of IT is. It's um, here in the Caribbean, close to Florida, Central America, uh, Cuba, Jamaica. All right. The divine island of IT. Um, so it, we're in the frame of a three day seminar hosted by Paul Hendrickson. And today is the day that he wanted to focus on history. For us, history um, is very important. To remember is very important. And I would like to speak about what it means in uh, the south of Abiyala. One of our great freedom fighters, Tupac Amaru II, was murdered brutally together with his whole family. And I won't uh, go into the details of his, the, the murder of his family by um, the colonizers in a 
traditional European manner. So the tradition was that um, that was reproduced not only by you know our famous freedom fighters but also by many anonymous ones. He uh, was to be dismembered by horses. His all of his members were tied to one horse, and then the Spanish colonizers would make this horse gallop and break the body apart. In the case of Tupac Amaru, that didn't work. So the Spanish colonizers cut his body in pieces. Once they had cut his body, they spread it along the territory and exposed it publicly. Later on, his pieces were buried. This is not only the case of Tupac Amaru, this also happened with uh, General Jean-Jacques de Salines, it was the filet who remembered his body parts and buried him. It also happened with Patrice Emeris Lumumba, first and only elected prime minister of the Republic of Congo. We believe in the Tawantinsuyu that the body parts of Tupac Amaru II are remembering, they are coming back together. And we believe that when that happens, there will be a pachakuti, a change of time, where these times of terror and horror we're living will finish and a new time will come. So in the frame of that horror, I invited today Professor Melo and Hugan Janela Fontan to help us teach us and help us remember the great political Congress of Wakaiman, hoping that we will, with our open hearts, learn to abolish the system of horror we're living and cultivate a better time, a better life in, with love and reciprocity with Mother Earth. Um, so, Wakaiman was a political congress, a war council, and a vodou ceremony that uh, happened the 14th. It is historically said to have happened the 14th of August of 1791, but uh, Professor Bello and Hugan and Daniel Lafontaine teach us that it was multiple in time and space. Um, it is a congress where many African nations as well as, as well as other people came together in difference and decided that they would as one live free or die. It is the Congress that sparked the glorious and triumphant Haitian revolution. I have some questions for our guests. But before I continue, I would like to um, give you the opportunity to say something. If you want to say something, correct me. If you need to correct me or um, add whatever else you want to add. Professor Velowi. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. um, the only thing I would like to add, since all of our teaching or most of our teaching is in language as songs so to to underline that need for memory that you just mentioned we'd like to add ibo lele ibo lele o ibo lele o maya maga mba jwe o ibo lele ibo lele o Memory is vital, and Ibolele is our connection to all memories throughout humanity. So we're going to be speaking about the telluric and cosmic importance of Wakaiman. 
Jandani, would you like to say something, add something? We can continue if you, at this point, you wouldn't want to say anything. All right. No, no, it's been said perfectly. I have nothing to add to that. It's actually wonderful. And I thank Professor Bello for reminding us of the song of the Igbo, which is uh, quite important in the context of Bwakaima, and we'll certainly will talk about that. Well, actually, um, Jean-Daniel, because there's a part that I forgot to say, and it has to do with what your teachings. And since Baina, uh, Professor Velo has sang that beautiful uh, song, I would let you pro please, um, Jean-Daniel, speak about the importance of the Igbo at this point, if you, um, if you can, and the meaning of Wakaiman. In 2004, I had the privilege of working with uh, a very large Igbo community based in Chicago who wanted to celebrate the 200 um, year of, um, of the war of independence in Haiti. And they wanted to do it at the very specific site um, known as Wakaima in Mont Rouge. And one um, Professor Iwike, who's Igbo actually, wanted to reunite different um, African uh, countries around that event. Unfortunately, the event was canceled because there was a coup d'etat at the time in 2004. And um, they had decided you know, to postpone that great reunification that was going to take place at the time um, on the side of Wakaima in Haiti. And one thing that I've learned from uh, my Igbo um, brothers and sisters is that the word in their language meant to unite and plan in the sense of planning the future. And it occurred to me at that time that the, multi, the multiple sites that I had not discovered, but that I had realized existed, that were named Wakaima or Kaim, simply Kaima in different parts of, uh, of Haiti in the South and the North, uh, that it was actually more of a Congress than an actual, um, ceremony as they say however uh, in vodou if two people meet the law generally are present so every occasion every meeting is a celebration of the law and the ancestors so um for me is me a ceremony but it's also maybe the, the, the most significant event that happened, at least in the Americas, in the last 200 years. For me, it was the beginning of freedom and the, the, the glorious reversal of um, that existed at the time that exists today. Um, I'm sorry, my internet is a little bit unstable. Uh, Professor Velo is there or she um, left? I don't know if she can hear us. Well, maybe it's my problem. I'm just going to continue. That's amazing, Jean Daniel. It's, um, we're going to be speaking. I, I definitely think that we're going to be speaking about the significance of this Congress for all of the Americas, but also for the planet and furthermore for the universe or the pluriverse. And um, 
I find it amazing the significance in Ivo language. Come, let us gather, discuss. You know, it was a calling to converse and to, as you say, plan the future. And um, since uh, I don't know if Baina is there, I'm going to continue with a question I have for you, uh, Jean Daniel. You told me once that the struggle for freedom in IT, we're, we're going to start in the islands, was not only to abolish the enslavement of African peoples, but also to liberate Mother Earth from the shackles of monoculture that was a plantation system. So you just said that when two people meet, by an ice pack, it's not only when two people meet, it's not only the people that meet, but also the loas meet. So here, for those that don't know, maybe we're gonna need a little explanation, but let us say that um, in that context of freedom that was beyond the African nations, it was freedom of mother earth and understanding that when two people meet in uh, Haiti and in Haitian Buddhism, it's not only the people, but also the invisible being, the visible and the invisible being, the tangible and intangible forces. I wanted to ask you and um, Baina. Baina, can you hear us? Are you back? Yes, uh, yes I am. Sorry. Mm -hmm. So, um, John Daniel just mentioned that the meaning of Wakaiman in Igbo language is come, let us gather, discuss. And he told me once that um, the, um, the struggle for freedom in Haiti was not only to abolish the enslavement of African peoples, but it was also to liberate, 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 liberate mother culture that was the plantation economy. So he also mentioned that when two people meet in Haiti, also the Loas meet. So in that frame of visible and invisible beings coming together, tangible and intangible forces coming together, I wanted to ask you to, um, in the Congress of Wakaiman, could we say that the conveners were not only humans, those multiple nations, different nations, but also were other living beings of the complex of the forest and the territory. That they understood that that colonial catastrophe was enslaving them too. Could we say that alligators, that birds, that trees, that stones, that fungus, that leaves, that the moon, that Venus, that bacteria that flies co-conspired in the war for freedom. Absolutely. Uh, that's the reality of the world. We have been conditioned into this science that says, you know, only ten tangible, only what we see, but that does not exist. Uh, I'm looking at uh, Cecilia, and I, I don't see even 5% of her skin, and skin is the largest organ she has. But as I look as I look at as I look at you, the most important thing that we share, hold on a minute, hold on please. You see, exactly. You see those things that are activated right now? Nobody can unactivate them. They're always present. So let me see if I can just... They totally agreed with me. They're like, yes, Cecilia, we're here with you. Yes. Oh, okay. 
So we were saying that the world, there are greater invisible presence than there are visible presences. Janania, would you like to respond to the question, add, guide us? Quite often we separate ourselves from other elements of nature. Um, but I think not only to form of arrogance, of us who generally have a year ex life expectation of about a hundred years, when there are trees that do live thousands of years, when there are animals, sea mammals, for instance, that live, that, that live 300, 400 years. So who are we to decide that we are superior to other species or other element of nature that have been there before us? and that have the knowledge of our ancestors. For instance, us as human, physical, as a physical body, if we are buried um, in the soil, for instance, the tree that grows over us carries the memory of our physical body. Our flesh becomes the they are one with that tree that carries the memory of a physical body. So how can a plant not be a part of an event as great as the ceremony of Wakaima? So for me, an event of that magnitude would need the participation of every single element of nature, of every single element, visible and invisible. In that sense, I think that Boakayima is probably um, an event where all forces of nature and of the universe in us and outside of us was present to seal that decision to live free or die, to nurture the, 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 that pact of living again as human and to defy a system that basically enslaved us and also enslaved them because enslaving me is evidently enslaving you. Um, so for me, Boakayima is a single event that defy all of that system, a system in which greed uh, becomes the only motivation. So it's a system that dehumanizes, and it's a system that desacralizes us as human beings, as spiritual beings, and it affects also everything in nature. Absolutely. And if I were to return, if I'm allowed to return a little bit to what I was saying, the invisible is dominant. The visible is a spark in the world. I was using Cecilia as an, uh, as an example. And I mentioned how even her skin, we only see a very small part of it. But then we also do not see Cecilia's thoughts. We do not see Cecilia's words. We do not see Cecilia's feelings, Cecilia's emotions, Cecilia's desires. And all of these things that we don't see are so important in determining Cecilia's behavior, Cecilia's actions, which we can't see. So what we see is so little. So in denying the invisible, we deny the largest, the, the largest uh, 
uh, population of the world because most of, every, of existence is invisible. Now to go to what I heard from Ungan Jean-Daniel Lafontaine, an important thing that he mentioned that I will illustrate, our people gave a agreed to meet. In my understanding, we met on 12 different spots, 12 different spaces. Okay? As you already know, life is about time, space, and actions. We only have three vital elements in all the books we've written in the world. If you go to the essence of the story or the, uh, the scientific whatever, you will find it's all about es essentially it's time, space, action. So the time we agreed to was set by the movement of the moon. Everybody knew that once the moon was in this position, the meeting had to start. And when the moon got to this position, the meeting had to stop, no matter what. So there was no time for a lot of yank, yank, yank. You just have essential. Answer one question. What must we do so our children and our children's children do not suffer the misery that we're experiencing now? This is it. Don't tell us about how it is in your plantation or your master, how this, no, no, no. What can we do? The action placed in time, our children, our children, children. So it's set in the future, not the now. What must we do? What can we do? So our children, our children, children do not suffer the that we are knowing now. So we're looking at the sky, we're being guided by the movement of the moon to decide the action of the visible people. Now, so many messages, how could people who are in chain, who cannot go and relieve themselves, plan a meeting throughout the island? How can that be? No telephone, no cell phone, no Zoom. How do they plan it? Obviously, the birds had to carry messages. Animals were involved. It was not a strictly human-human deal. And we, and precisely in Voodoo, we are very much aware. When we sing songs like, um, by, um, oh, no, no. The song escaped me. But anyway, we have maybe you. I'm sorry. I think Jean Daniel knows his song. Feuilla va sauver moi. Remember us. Jean Daniel, please tell us the song. I think you remember. Feuilla va sauver moi. Is that this one? Feuilla va sauver moi. Exactly. So it is showing us how within the voodoo system, we are always involved with every element, living element of life. We have songs about the wind, songs about the trees, songs about the leaves, songs about our relationship, how a leaf is going to protect the human. We are, so obviously, if this is our, we have these songs to show us what our worldview is what our philosophy of life is. So every life form has right. So we cannot do the right of Aishans on this island and not defend the right of humans, wherever they may be. We cannot defend the, the right for a group of people and not defend the right of freedom for trees for rivers, for mountains, for Amazons. We have to. It is the only way to truly talk about freedom is to look at all of it. And most importantly, look how slavery function. The enslaver comes into a space. 
And he decides, all right, all these people who are here are savages, kill them. I don't need them. Uh, those trees, I don't want them either. Don't know what kind of tree they are. Don't know what they do. Don't know what illness they can cure. No knowledge. But hey, I want 100 acres cleared out here. Oh, you can't do the job? Let me go to Africa. Let me kidnap some folks there. They look very strong. They should be able to do this job. Bring them here. Get the space. Get uh, and process the, the murder of trees. You know how many animals you kill every time you kill a tree? You know how many insects, how many birds will no longer survive because this particular tree is the only way for them to live? But who cares? Hey, listen, it's all about greed, money, domination. So let's slaughter all this mountain here. Cannot, that is a horrible crime, much more horrible than what you did to Africans. So in fighting for freedom, for a group, a person, that's good. That's a great space to start. But we have to understand the real fight is to fight for the forests, fight for the rivers, fight for the to have the life that they are in and that that life will guarantee our life. invisible world is so much greater. Life is so much more than me, human. No, you human cannot exist without vegetables, without fruits. So how do you get into your dummy head that you are superior to all life form? Show me how you human can survive without oxygen. Here's another invisible master. Yeah, you can survive without oxygen. You can't. So how do you get this dummy idea in your head that you're superior to everything? Some of us know how to dance in fire because we have great communication with fire and we can negotiate the space within fire. You can't. You only use to either cook or destroy. So I think there's a lot for us to learn. And as Vadu teaches, learn each day so you will do better tomorrow than you did yesterday. So life is not about owning. It's not about domineering, but it is about being able to live in harmony with all life forms. Diversity is a way of life. Diversity guarantees wealth, abundance. But we must understand every life form has rights. But let me try to very quickly set Bakaima. The Congress we met at the risk of being killed because the law was if three people, we Africans are found together without permission, all three will be hung. That's it. No ask. No debate. But this woman, Cecile Fatima, is going to take four years to think through and organize a meeting that would take place, guided by the moon, in 18. She first planned 18 different places on the island of Haiti, because that's also the name of the entire island. So, but six of them failed, were aborted. So she, organized, she managed to do 12 of them from Punta Cana, in what is now called Republic Dominican, to Leziwa, which is the western tip of Haiti. She programmed 12 different meetings in 12 different, in the heart of different forests to think for just the, you see the moon from here to there, and then make a decision. And the decision was made. The only way to come out of this is to fight. These people only understand violence. They only understand force. 
So they will not agree to anything except that they take it by force. And that's why, that's where in one of those meetings, Bookman Duty from Jamaica was sold away from Jamaica because his mother was a freedom fighter to punish his mother. He was colony uh, domain. He became a Ungan. And in that meeting, his speech was down through here, through, through memory. There was no writer down his speech. But we repeated it from 1791 to today. We repeat what he said and said to us. Essentially, God, the divine, is your don't let anybody tell you you're not human. God is your father. And he demands that you free yourself. He promises to help, but you must do the work. Mostly, you must listen to the voice of liberty which speaks in each one of your hearts. So actually, he tells us that if we take the time to listen to our heart, we will know what freedom looks like, and we will know the path to freedom. And actually, those who create slavery systems could become free from that mentality if they would take the time to listen to their hearts and hear the voice of freedom. Time you say the only way to do this is this one way. That is a slave mentality speaking in you. There is always many ways of doing the same thing. There are always many ways. And diversity is abundance. Diversity leads to freedom. So Wakaima set the time, time space synchronicity for freedom to rise within the hearts and to lead us to 1803. 1804 is the Declaration of Independence on January 1st, but the was what happened in 1803. The project was created in 1803. And from that Congress, Dessaline became the leader. Dessaline, when everybody was against Miranda in Ecuador, in South America, Miranda, the boats, the money, the men, the to continue his freedom fighting. After Dazzling death, Petion took over. When Bolivar was in trouble, he came to IT. And Bolivar repeated Dazzling's gestures to Miranda with Bolivar. And Bolivar went 5,000 Haitian troops, three Haitian boats, money, et cetera, et cetera, and three several South African countries. So it's not a local business. What was done in Wakaima was for our planet. Ultimately, we as human beings are here as guardians of the planet, not the chief of the planet. The earth would never cut a tree without all kinds of ceremonies asking that tree permission to cut it. In fact, there is an anecdote in uh, Christopher Columbus journal. He says that the first tree he wanted to, to cut, he had to kill 585 Arawaks before he find the one who would agree to stop trying to kill them. They would say things like, he, I mean, his book, he says in his journal, they would say stupid things like, oh, the tree is much older than me. I can't raise my hand on it. Oh, the, this tree must be at least 200 years old. I cannot touch it. That's the kind of stuff, you know. But that's the human way. Life is one life. And until we get to that point, we understand life is one life. And 
every life own is important. Every life own has rights. Wow, that's amazing. Ashe, Aibobo, I mean, your words are so deep and uh, each one of them, <laughs> they're such important lessons. And um, maybe what I, um, what I would like to say that this context of mass destruction, what Professor Bello was speaking about, mountains, the dismemberment of, the, of our territories, the mountains, cutting of trees without understanding the complex of life because now Western science, this year only, there has been one scientist, a female scientist white from the United States that has, you know, after fighting much with her colleagues has published a book where she says that there is communication between fungus in the root and that you know one tree passes information to another but the millinery science of Vodou that Haitians cultivate and pass to each other has known this exactly for millions and millions of years so what Professor Willow is doing like let us sit down and listen is so important in the context of so much destruction of this planet and the notion that when one destroys what one thinks is the other one is destroying oneself and that has to just stop. Um, so maybe let's go back to what Huganja um, Daniela Fontan has said about um, the ceiling of an agreement because I think maybe this is and maybe I'm projecting this on our audience but Sometimes I feel it might be hard for Europeans to understand. That is, um, Professor Bello, when you say, uh, sometimes you say just breathing is, um, you receive and you give back. It is a reciprocity. What is given to you, you give back. But the modern colonial European system is a system of garbage. You throw, you throw, you throw, you destroy, you throw, you throw, you throw. You take with greed as both of you have said, you desacralize, as both of you have said, because, but in order to desacralize something else, you have to first desacralize yourself. So you, uh, that's why I think Be Professor Belo's teachings are so important to really search within oneself for the divine, and then one will find the divine also outside, because, well, we know that the destruction is so terrible, and we are all or maybe most of us, not Jean Daniel and Baina, <laughs> are <laughs> complicit in the destruction of this, our planet. And I wanted to speak about one thing that is um, in the imaginary of uh, the Europeans, um, um, is called uh, sacrifice, but I want to speak about offerings. And all, of, all that is given to us by Mother Earth, many cultures give back to Mother Earth. So Jean Daniel gave the example of when one is dead, one actually gives the body to Mother Earth and Mother Earth transforms that. And even as Jean Daniel said, carries the information in a tree or in any other form. For instance, one can plant one's placenta to thank Mother Earth for all that, for the life that was given to one. And that placenta is filled with biological nutrients that you give back to Mother Earth. Um, for example, in Walmapu territory, uh, on the longest night of the, of the year, we have a ceremony where we make offerings uh, to the forces that inhabit with us the territory and we repact our um, relations of reciprocity. So we don't take our relationships for granted we have to each cycle renew our relationships with the beings that surround us. So we know that, uh, well, I, I believe that happens in Vodou in general, if not every day, because you know, Jean Daniel, I know from uh, my life a little bit with Jean Daniel, he wakes up every morning, he pours his libations, he knocks the doors of the Lord. So every day he's repacting his relationships. But I would like to speak about Wakaiman. 
were their offerings at Wakaiman? And what is the significance in the frame of repacting relationships of reciprocity, in the frame of restoring primordial matter? Were their offerings at Wakaiman? And what is the significance? What can we learn from that? Jean Daniel, would you like to go? Or Baina? Please, no, I just spoke. Please go ahead. Thank you, Professor Bello. Uh, I like to say that in, in, in Vodou, for instance, we, we give a lot of offering to the loi. But the loi generally, consume a very small portion of what is being offered. In reality, the community benefits more from the offering, from the general offering, than the loi themselves. Or maybe they consume uh, in the same manner. The reason being that the, the offering to the loi is a constant reminder of not only their existence, but of living in unity with them. Part of it is also an offering to the ancestors to remind us that we are our ancestors and that we carry within us not only their general memory, but also their living memory. As I believe that we carry within us, not only the memory of the ancestors, but their experience. I believe that I am a recipient of what my fathers, my forefathers, my mothers and great grandmothers lived in their own life, good and bad. And by tapping into that memory, I know also that I carry not only their experience, but also their knowledge and their science. We are talking, I'm saying, the, the, the conventional science. Dog, the dog that is beaten, the, the, the small dogs that they will have in fear will remember whoever mistreated the, the, the mother dog or the father dog. And it's the same for us. We have within us the experience, the knowledge, and the science of each of our ancestors. So by pouring a libation, water, on the floor, by putting coffee as a sign of respect for these ancestors, it's a constant reminder of who we are and how we should live in harmony with those invisible forces. As Professor Bello says, wonderfully said it, those forces that are by far more, more in terms of existence than the, 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 the visible, than the physical that we see. So it's a way to revive ourselves and a way to pay tribute to all these energies and forces that are invisible that we don't see. It's an exchange. So offering is to vivify these forces and vivify us as the human being and us as element of nature. So for me, this is the symbolism of offering.
Yes, indeed. Very well put, Olga Jean Daniel Lafontaine. I will give just an illustration of what he just said. We have a practice at home to bury the um, placenta after delivery. We bury the placenta. I'm from Petit Guave, and that's what we do up until me. <laughs> so we bury the placenta and plant a tree on that placenta. And so it can happen that, uh, let's say, I am living in Germany and something goes wrong. There's a war, there's people running, or there's you know, a flood, whatever. There is problem in Germany, in the town where I am. And my parents are out of touch with me. They can't get me on the phone. They can't find a letter. They're wondering what happened to Baina. Well, they will go to that tree and they will do certain ceremonies to find out how is Baina. And they will get the answer from the tree. Oh, she's fine. Don't you worry about her. She was, you know, out of town or when this happened or whatever. You see? Or if something happened, uh, parents run away, political problems in Haiti, whatever, somebody will go to the tree and write a phone number on the tree so that. Whatever I had as communication, as a way to communicate with my parents, which is no longer valid because of the turmoil in the country. Well, by writing the phone number on that tree, I could call. I will know that phone number in a couple of days. It will come to my head. And I will call my grandmother, my great grandmother, to find out where is the family, how, how is the family. So this is just very practical. Things that might look very weird to others. And what's most important for us in our practice is to be intentional. To know for a fact that when I sit here, there are all the others who are sitting here with me that I don't see. When I'm talking, there are all these others talking in my head, guiding me. So I may express things in the right way, in the right dosage, right quantity, because not all truth must be spoken out in every way, in every depth, because you have to give it in a dosage that those who are listening can receive and receive something they could do something with, because knowledge is not for knowing. It's not, I have a PhD and I could talk 500 years of history. No, knowledge is for doing better. That's why we know. We learn so we can be better tomorrow. So if what we're learning does not improve, if what we learn make us rise above the others and feel superior, obviously it was not knowledge because knowledge built knowledge construct, knowledge harmonize. When you know, the more you know, the more you... Listen to the word. You say you went to the university, okay? So you went to learn knowledge of the universe. And because you went to the university, you won't talk to Jean Daniel because he's only a Unga. You will not talk to Baina because she's a woman. You're not to Cecilia because she is from Haiti. Obviously, you don't have knowledge because when you have knowledge, you know how to embrace. You know how to harmonize. You know how to bring synchronicity. You know that the birds has rights and function is the way of life. So birds has a purpose. The fish has purpose. Each different human on a different space, in a different shade, in a different form, have their purpose. So if I don't know your purpose, how could I determine who you are and what you are all about? And what it is, most importantly, what it is we can do together. Only in the purpose can we come together. We don't have, we don't have to marry each other. We don't have to this, that, and the other. No, but in the purpose of life. We have to figure out what it is you and I can do together. And 
all of the universe has purpose. The moon has purpose. The sun has purpose. And you move one thing, you disrupt so much. Well, there's been so, I mean, that's so amazing. And oh, Jean-Daniel, would you like to say something? Yes, I, I, I thought you agree with Professor Bello. And um, to confirm and corroborate what she just said, I, I, I would say that knowledge should actually bring really empathy. And because only empathy allows us to understand the other. And I'm not talking about the other as a human being only. I'm talking about all the forces in nature. Not only to understand, to be sensitive to them, but to also understand that these invisible forces and these visible beings are us. So knowledge should give us that mirror, that empathy to understand that everything in that world and the world beyond is us and within us. So that should be the ultimate goal of knowledge. Um, so knowledge should allow each of us not only to be better, as Professor Bello said, but to evolve and understand that the other is us. So. Um, we uh, have spoken so much and so greatly. And um, first, uh, one thing I forgot to um, mention before, everything that you have said is has great impact on me but one thing that i think i would like to point out is how the conveners of wakaman all were uh, had great knowledge of astronomy all of them had great knowledge of the territory all of them were great scientists um, without having any formal education speaking about phds <laughs> So I think that's amazing. Um, uh, that's uh, uh, very impressive for me. And one other thing that I would like to um, repeat that both of you have said. Um, well, maybe let me say, um, before the European colonizers arrived in our territory, uh, Montezuma dreamt exactly how the Europeans, where they were going to arrive, how they were going to be dressed, what were the ships they were going to be coming in. But it was not only him. Many peoples across our territory had dreams and prophesied that there would be a cosmic catastrophe coming. And that's what we are living. So in that frame, Hugan Jean Daniel Lafontaine and Professor Vaina Bello are uh, speaking to us about changing a system of greed of extractivism, of entitlement for, and monoculture for cultivating multiplicity and diversity, for asking for permission, for working to harmonize relationships within ourselves and with other beings, seeking for uh, reciprocity. Uh, and I think well, I thank you from the depths of my heart for those teachings and